All right. Look at all those little kitties. Don't, don't, don't we have the cutest kids at the river? They're so cute. You pinch them's little cheeks. I love them babies. I, one of the very first areas of ministry I served in, probably the very first area of ministry I served in was kids ministry, and I did it for probably 20 years. And so I just have such a soft spot for them little babies. I love them. <clears throat> well, this morning, I am going to share with you kind of a, um, a part two of the good works lesson that we talked about a few weeks ago. And um, our, our keystone scripture, well, one of our scriptures, when we got into the power of good works was we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And we talked about how we have the power to take what's inside of us and give it away and give it to others. And that's how our good works um, happen. It's Christ being so big in you that he has no other exit ramp than to go out and be a blessing to others through you, right? <clears throat> but when I was uh, praying and preparing um, in the, com the leading days up to this, I just couldn't land on where I wanted to be. I didn't know right away that this is what I wanted to speak on. And um, I went from everything to wanting to talk about fear to, I don't know. I mean, I was just digging and praying and seeking the Lord. And I spent three hours on Friday. Betsy kept my sweet baby so I could do that. And um, I felt like I wasted her time because after three hours of studying on Friday, I still felt no closer to today than, than when I started. But it was all for a purpose. The Lord uses all of it. Do you ever feel like you're not making any progress in your life, going nowhere fast? Don't be discouraged because all of that is part of what God is doing. So that time of study um, all built up into what I feel the Lord has laid on my heart to share with you all today. <clears throat> I want to share with you, when I was praying, um, I think it was Friday morning, and um, I'm, I'm just like, Lord, what do you want me to say? I was getting ready in the morning. I had woke up late. I had slept terrible. It was an awful night. So Sayla, she is nine, almost ten months old. And she slept great from ages two, uh, from two months to six months, four months, 11 hours a night, every night. How many of you know that is rare, right? I mean, it was almost without fail, the kids slept great. Six months, boom, flips a switch. She's up twice a night without fail. She's, whatever she does, she's going to do it without fail. I'll give her that. Like, she's steadfast. She's faithful. She's loyal. Dedicated. It's, it's good. Appreciate that quality someday. <clears throat> but um, she's also has, she's not crawling yet. But the other morning we went into her um, bedroom to get her up, and she was sitting up in her crib for the first time where she had gotten from laying to sitting up all by herself and she can pull herself up to standing so then it was like okay now it's time to lower the mattress so that she doesn't flip herself out because she's still top heavy like babies are little bobbleheads just whoop. and uh but I hadn't got the mattress lowered. We hadn't done it the night before because we got in late. And I'm like, oh, she'll be fine. She's only sat up in the crib one time. Well, guess who was awake all night long, just really concerned that she was going to flip head first out of her crib <clears throat> Friday night. So in my delirium on Friday morning, I, uh, I just asked the Lord, like, Lord, what would you have me speak? I don't, I don't know if fear is the right thing to share on. And I... I was kind of shying away from it because it felt more clinical than spiritual, what I had to share. And I always want to share something that's Bible, that's right in the middle of the Bible, you know. I don't want to just share something you can go out and get a self-help book and, and read. and That's not what this is. So 
I just heard in my spirit, Treasure Island. Now, I have never read the book Treasure Island. I had to Google it to even find out what it was about, when it was written, who wrote it. Forgive me, Robert Louis Stevenson, for not knowing that that was you. <clears throat> but I just heard this phrase, Treasure Island. And I, uh, so I started studying treasure in the Bible. And I, I got this picture in my brain. Do you have that picture, Jason? So before I even Googled this and found this picture, this is almost exactly what I saw in my mind's eye when I heard Treasure Island just kind of drop in my spirit. I saw this massive area of sand, and I saw just clay pots as far as the eye could see, just vessels of clay pots, just row after row after row, at row almost like an army. And so I started studying treasure. <clears throat> Because we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Treasure Island, I'm seeing earthen vessels. This must be what I'm supposed to talk about. <clears throat> oh, thank you. But as I began to study further and deeper, I knew that what the Lord wanted me to talk about was not as much the treasure, but the vessel today. <clears throat> Let's start in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Oh, I forgot to start my timer. How many minutes was that, you guys? Is that, are those free minutes? Those are free minutes. Right? <laughs> All right, bonus minutes. It's like soccer, and they take all the penalties, and then they add it on as a bonus at the end of the game, like extra minutes to play. That's what we have today. Sorry. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. Can we stand for the reading of the word, please? For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may, <clears throat> excuse me, may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. Father, we thank you for this word today. We thank you for our time together. Lord, I pray that hearts would be prepared, would be open. Lord, that we'd be honest with ourselves. And Lord, that we would receive your word, that we would receive your Holy Spirit in its, all its forms, in the comfort, in the convicting, in the power. Lord, that we would not deny any piece or any part of who you are in our lives today and what you want to do in this house. Bless this time together. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, can I get the fans turned off? I'm so sorry. I've been having some throat issues this week, and those are making me kind of coughy. So forgive me if I have to pop a lozenge at some point here in a little bit. Y'all can just pray for my throat. <clears throat> so I do want to talk a little bit about the treasure. So we'll start there because obviously the treasure is important. So what is this treasure and why do we have it? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. So the treasure, if we go to that scripture in 2 Corinthians, the treasure is the light of Christ in you. And I'm reminded of that story in uh, the Old Testament where Gideon, the Lord, pairs his army down to 300 men. God literally makes it impossible for his army to beat the Midianites, who are way outnumbered them. And then God says, leave your swords at your sides. Don't use your swords. Get a pitcher and a torch and a trumpet, and we're going to war. But what God had them do was to put the torch inside of the pitcher. <clears throat> Just like in the scripture where it says that the treasure 
within you is the light of Christ, right? As shown in the face of Christ, that light dwells within us. So a few weeks ago, we talked about that spurring one another onto good works. Christ in you is to be shared with others. So Christ in you is that treasure, right? It's a powerful treasure. It's the only treasure in this world that even matters. But I want to expand our view of this treasure in earthen vessels. So the second purpose of this treasure, the treasure has two purposes. One, it's to serve the world around you, right? It's to serve your brothers and sisters in Christ, and it's to draw other people to Jesus. That light is a drawing. But the second purpose is for the benefit of the vessel. It's for you. Christ in you is for you too. It's for me. There are benefits to receiving Christ. We don't stop there. There's so much more to that gift in you, right? <clears throat> but the treasure must benefit the vessel, heal the vessel, make the vessel whole, in order for the vessel to be capable of sharing the treasure and carrying the treasure that's inside. So the treasure makes the vessel. <clears throat> now imagine my husband when he proposed, he got down on one knee and he had a ring box. And there, you know, all the girls, whenever they see that ring box, they're like, oh my God, I know what's happening. Is this for real? <laughs> you can't be serious. When my husband asked me to marry him, I said, shut up. This isn't happening right now. But imagine he gets down on one knee, cracks that box open, and there's a big fat nothing burger <laughs> in the box. How much is that box worth? Not much. 32 cents, whatever they paid for it <clears throat> at the jewelry store. But if he opens it up and it's got a ring in there with a diamond, not a man-made, the real thing, the box now has treasure and the box now has value, right? The box is now serving its purpose. It's now carrying what it was created to carry, what it was meant to carry. And the box now means something, right? It's no longer just a box. The vessel makes, or the treasure makes the vessel. <clears throat> There's this relationship between the treasure and the vessel that must be bound together. Because the vessel is not unimportant. The vessel carries, the vessel keeps safe. Imagine you, you say, Joe says, hey, uh, can you give me some coffee? And, and I go, and I get a pot of coffee, and I just like, you know, like, here you go, Joe. You wanted some coffee. No, the cup that holds the coffee is vitally important to getting that coffee to him, right? So there's this relationship where the treasure brings value to the vessel, but the vessel is vitally important to the treasure's purposes, and the treasure where it needs to go and what it needs to do. So we are bound to Christ in this relationship. When we ask Christ to come and fill us, he heals us, he gives us purpose, he gives us value. But now we, we become needed in the transaction. You can't just receive the treasure and go nowhere with it. The whole reason the treasure comes into that vessel is so that it can be taken somewhere. If I've, how many of you have seen National Treasure? Okay, so there's like that big, like, underground thing, and it's like treasure for miles. Now, if I'm going to take that treasure anywhere, it has to go in a vessel. It has to go in a box. 
in a jar, in a bag, in a semi-truck, whatever. It's necessary. (coughs) Excuse me. The treasure that we carry inside of us is the very thing that we were created to carry, the very thing that we were created for. When God bit down over Adam and breathed in the breath of life, he didn't just breathe in air. He breathed in spirit. And when Christ came to the earth, he wasn't plan B. God always intended to indwell with us. And he chose Christ as that vessel, Christ as the vehicle to come, to be crucified, to rise again so that he could send his Holy Spirit so that Christ in us could become a reality. So that the very thing we were created to carry, we could now carry. There was always a friction between sacrifices and, and carrying the glory of God in a, a golden box, in a, the Ark of the Covenant, and the glory of God would be carried. But we fought, fast forward to the New Testament, it tells us that we carry Christ in us. The glory of the Lord shines in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Plan A. What we were called for, what we were purposed for, what we were created to carry. The word human in Latin means spirit in dirt. We have this treasure in dirt pots, in vessels of clay. Who we are matters only in light of what we carry. Only in light of who he is. Anybody in this world that tries to discover who they are without Christ is never going to find who they are. Because who they are depends on who Christ is. They're going to search far and wide and long and hard and they'll never find their purpose. They'll never find their identity. Because from day one, from the minute life is breathed into your lungs, you are called to carry Christ. That's our purpose. It doesn't matter where the vessel is. It doesn't matter what the vessel looks like. The value of the treasure remains the same. Excuse me. Um, Mom shared with me, and they had shared in their prayer group a couple of weeks ago, an excerpt from the Jesus Calling devotional. Have any of you all heard of the Jesus Calling devotional? It's an excellent daily devotion. It's, It's nuggets of deep wisdom, things that you can chew on for a week. But this one from February the 20th says, Learn to live from your true center in me. I reside in the deepest depths of your being, in eternal union with your spirit. It is at this deep level that my peace reigns continually. You will not find lasting peace in the world around you, in circumstances, or in human relationships. The external world is always in flux under the curse of death and decay. But there is a gold mine of peace deep within you, waiting to be tapped. Take time to delve into my riches of my residing presence. I want you to live increasingly from your real center where my love has an eternal grip on you. I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. That phrase there, it says, there's a gold mine of peace deep within you. It talks about the deepest depths of your being. At this deep level, my peace reigns. 
In that story of Gideon, God told them to get pitchers. And one of the word, the root of that word pitcher is an unused Hebrew word, but it means deepen. Get something deep. Get something that I can deposit deep into. Get a vessel that's deep, that has capacity, that has space. So what is this treasure and what exactly do we have? I mean, Christ in you, man, that sounds great. That sounds wonderful, right? But what really does that mean? What really, what really is that? Colossians 1.27 says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So it's hope of glory. It's hope of something better. It's hope of the next home, hope of heaven. The Bible says God placed eternity in our hearts. We, we were created with that longing for eternal connection with him. 1 John 4.4 4, it says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. It's a power that's greater than any other power in this world. It's hope. It's power. Romans 8.10 says, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. So it's life. Christ in you is life. Acts 1.8 says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses. So it's power to speak. It's power to go. In Christ, we have life. 1 John 10.10, it says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life. And not just life but life more abundant, an exuberant life, a life that exceeds expectation. Colossians 2, 1 through 5 says, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this that no one may deceive you. When we come together every Sunday morning, Wednesday night prayer, we have one goal. And that's to Worship Jesus in such a way that we open our spirits to him and he begins to develop us and build us up to be sent out. Right? So I tell you this so that no one may deceive you. There's a lot of things out there that can deceive you very easily. You can think, oh, I'm not deceived. Well, you don't have to be, like, deceived for a long period of time. You can be deceived in just a moment. <clears throat> you can think... <coughs> oh, sorry, that was loud. <clears throat> Good, strong lungs. You can think for even a half second that your spouse doesn't love you. You've, you've been deceived in that moment. We're all capable I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. You have to know and believe all day, every day, that Christ in you is better than anything else. Jesus only. Jesus plus nothing. 
Hebrews 6, pastor's been teaching on foundations from Hebrews 6. And we have got to make sure our foundations are sure, right? They've got to be shored up. We're in a season and in a time, not even a season, we're in a time, an era. I don't think it's any coincidence that the whole, like, Taylor Swift eras thing is a thing. Because I believe that God is, we are in a spiritual era. It's not a season. It's not four months on a calendar. We're in an era. We're in years of time where the Lord is doing something. But we're in a time where our foundations must be sure. We cannot live our lives on sand. We cannot live our lives uncertain and unstable. God needs his body to be mature and sure of their foundation. So we're revisiting those foundations. But Hebrews 6, it talks about we can't stay there. Matthew Henry's commentary says, Here observe, in order to grow, Christians must leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ. How must we leave them? They must not lose them. They must not despise them. They must not forget them but they must lay them up in their hearts and lay them as the foundation of all their profession and expectation. But laying the foundation, they must go on and build upon it. So we're over the next few weeks, we're going to dig in and we're going to work on our foundations, right? But then God is saying, don't stay there. Build upon it. Grow from it like that spiral staircase go up another level build upon what i've laid the foundation in your heart the foundation is laid on purpose to support the building but then he goes on and later on in hebrews 6 in verse 19 and 20 it says we have this hope as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So, and Matthew Henry goes on to say that an unseen glory within the veil is what the believer is hoping for. We all hunger for that glory. We all hunger for that, that deeper connection. We all hunger for the miraculous, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the peace that passes all understanding, the king of kings that rules and reigns in our hearts and minds. So an unseen Jesus within the veil is the foundation of this hope. The free grace of God, the merits and mediation of Christ, and the powerful influence of the Holy Spirit are the grounds of this hope. Christ in you, the hope of glory. How many of you know what a Stanley Cup is? Here's a cute little one. Has anyone noticed that these cups just kind of keep getting bigger and bigger? So this is, I mean, a reasonable size. It's probably, what, 20 ounces? What's it say? 18 ounces, just shy of 20. By the time you put ice in it, you bring it like three ounces of whatever you're drinking. Okay. Ooh. Yeah, this one's a little bigger, right? This one's maybe 28 ounces. It doesn't say. You have, just have to guess. So get this one. This holds, um, I mean, a fair amount of beverage, water, juice, whatever, coffee, tea, whatever you put in here. Then they came out with this one. Anybody seen a, a soccer mom toting this bad boy around? 40 ounces, three of these, and you've got your water intake for the entire day. And you can say to the world, I'm healthing right now. This is me healthing. You've heard of adulting? I'm healthing, right? It's a vessel. That's what it is. It's a vessel. It carries something that we need it to carry. Water, preferably. You put Skittles in it, I guess. It'd be fun. 
<clears throat> All right. The next size that we have. <laughs> this is for the really healthy among us. We were flying to Florida the day after the Arnold commenced, right, or finished up, wrapped up, closed. Everybody had won their awards. I'm not joking you. These people had their medals on in the airport. Okay. We're all proud of you. But you know how many water gallons I saw in the airport that day? Ga just gallon jugs of water. You know, they're just toting it around. It's their carry-on. <laughs> but I think our obsession with these vessels has gotten a little ridiculous. Don't you agree? I mean, this is ridiculous, but I mean, I like it. I think it's pretty cool. I mean, I think we did a good job on this. Okay. I think I just got spray paint in my mouth. <laughs> Gross. Good job, honey. Right here. This is the Stanley Cup to rival all. It's the Manly Cup. The treasure gives value to the vessel. Now I got stickers all over me. Oh, that's a messy. God chose us, jars of clay. God chose us as vessels to carry what he, he, to carry his goodness, to carry his light, to carry his very essence inside of us. The vessel is important, but not as what, much as what's inside. So this can sit on my shelf all day long. And if I don't put any water in it and I don't drink that water, it benefits me Zero. It's just cute. <clears throat> I've even seen where people have like charms that they hang down from here. And then have you seen the tray? You can get a snack tray that sits on top of this. You know, I should have brought a veggie tray and set it on top of it. And they even have like these little wraps on here that like have a zipper and you can put your, your like cards and stuff in it. But if you carry around a Stanley Cup all day long and you never put anything healthy in it to drink, it does you zero good, right? It's just cute and you're just trendy, I guess, whatever that's worth. <clears throat> we say to God, God, give me a miracle. I need a miracle. But God says to us, give me a vessel. Give me a vessel. Give me more of your vessel. The larger the vessel, the more oil he will pour in. The more space in the vessel, the more oil he will pour in. The more treasure, the more room there is for treasure. I don't just want a five-gallon vessel for the oil and the anointing and the treasure of God. Make it a hundred thousand gallons, Lord. I want all that you've got. I want the biggest size that it comes in. God created us to be filled, not just to sit, not just to look pretty. He created us to be filled. He created us for his glory. He created us to be fruitful, to be to multiply. To have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. But we forfeit our power. We forfeit our purpose when we look anywhere else but the treasure for our answers. When we look anywhere else but the treasure for our peace. When we look anywhere else but the treasure for wholeness and satisfaction. Some of the things that we most often, even as, as Christians, I'm not talking about people in the world, I'm talking about Christians. We look to our spouse to satisfy what only Christ can satisfy. Your spouse is not called to fulfill you. 
you complete me. No! Jesus completes us. We look to friends, friendships, relationships. Oh, I need you. No, you need Jesus. First, foremost, get in with Jesus first. We look to food. And I'm not just, I'm not like getting after the people that are eating junk food. I'm talking about like we look to health food as our answer. We think it will fix us. Exercise, medication, drugs, alcohol, social media. Did you know that social media registers on your brain like a drug? Look up the science. It, it, it feeds you something that you hunger for. But that thing that it's feeding, it's the hunger that it's satisfying, it's a hunger for Jesus. So we look to social media, man's praise. This is a big one for, for those of us who are in ministry like, like me or, or pastor. We're in a visible place of ministry. If I get up here and I speak to you today and no one says, man, that was a good message, you know what I immediately think? Ah, I blew it. That wasn't good. That's not what God wanted me to share. Looking to man's praise to validate what I've felt God has called me to do. No. You may get criticized. You may receive not only zero praise, but you may get criticism for something that God has called you to do. But you have to have your faith in the treasure that God has placed inside of you, the hope of glory. to get you, to keep you on track, to keep you past, to get you past that moment. Material possessions. Nature. I use nature sounds to put my kid to sleep sometime. Right? But sometimes we're like, oh, oh, I'm just overwhelmed. I need to go sit by a babbling brook. God gave us those things. I'm not criticizing that, but what I'm saying is if that's, if you go there and don't honor the creator and you go to that place and you don't honor the treasure that gave that, we've misappropriated our attention. Pleasure of all kinds. You fill in the blank. The enemy is after your vessel. The enemy doesn't just want to get you looking outside of the vessel. He wants to beat up your vessel. He wants to crush your vessel, break your heart, get you mad, get you offended. And then if he can't do any of that, he'll get you to glorify your vessel so that you look to the vessel rather than the treasure that's inside the vessel. That's what it is with these Stanley Cups. Glorifying the vessel. It's a water bottle. <laughs> right? And I ain't mad at anybody that's got a Stanley. I got two of them. I'm just saying, don't glorify the vessel over the treasure. If the musicians would come, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We've got to press into holiness and press into humility and press into righteousness and keep our vessels clean and keep our vessels pure and untainted from the world. The vessel's got to be worthy of the treasure. You've got to let God get in there and clean it up. You've got to let God get in there and heal it up. You've got to let God get in there and make it whole. In the old times, they had, if they had a, a clay pot that would, had a, a leak in it or a crack in it so that it would hold water, they would take a wax and they would fill those cracks up. But if the pot ever became subject to heat, you know what would happen? It would expose the crack again. 
When we let God come inside of our vessel, he doesn't fill the cracks with wax. He makes the pot new. There might be a beating. There might be a crushing. You might have to be ground down to fine powder again and be thrown on the the wheel and be remade. But it's for your good. It's so that he can deposit into you the riches of his glory. So that he can make you who you were always meant to be, who he's always called you to be. From Genesis 1, where he blew his breath into man, blew his spirit into man. In Genesis, Jesus is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he's the cloud and the fire. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's the judge and the lawgiver. In Ruth, he's the kinsman redeemer. In 1 and 2 Samuel, he's the prophet of the Lord. In 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles, he is the reigning king. In Ezra, he's the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of the broken down walls. In Esther, you see him as Mordecai. In Job, he is the day springer from on high. In Psalms, he's the Lord who is our shepherd. In Song of Solomon, he's the lover and the bridegroom. In Isaiah, the prince of peace. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, the wheel turning. In Daniel, the fourth man in the fire. In Jose, the bridegroom married to the backslidden woman. In Joel, baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. In Amos, the burden bearer. In Obadiah, the mighty savior. In the book of Jonah, the forgiving God. In Micah, the messenger with beautiful feet. In Nahum, the avenger of God's elect. In Zephaniah, the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Haggai, the cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, the merciful father. In Malachi, the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, he's the Messiah. In Mark, he's the wonder worker. In Luke, he's the son of man. And in John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's our ascended Lord. In Romans, the justifier. In Corinthians, the gifts of the spirit. In Galatians, the one who sets us free. In Ephesians, he's the Christ of riches. In Philippians, he's the God who meets our every need. In Colossians, the fullness of the Godhead embodied. In Thessalonians, he's the soon and coming king. In Timothy, the mediator between God and man. In Titus, the faithful pastor. In Philemon, the friend that sticks closer than a brother. In Hebrews, the blood that washes away my sins. In James, he's the great physician. In Peter, the chief shepherd, an everlasting love. In Jude, he's the Lord who came down with 10,000 saints. And in Revelation, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And everything that he is, from Genesis to Revelation, he wants to be inside of you and inside of me. He wants to be the shepherd. He wants to be the great riches. He wants to be the king of glory, the reigning king, the healer. Everything that we need, he is. Open your vessel to his treasure. Open your vessel to the God of Genesis. Open your vessel to the God of Revelation. Open your vessel to all that he is and all that he wants to do in you and through you. (laughs) 
Look nowhere else for your answers. Look nowhere else for your peace. Look nowhere else to be satisfied. Nobody can satisfy like Jesus can. I don't care how good your best friend is. They can betray you. They're capable. They're human. We all are. I can betray you. I can hurt you. But Jesus, he's closer than a brother. He's the fullness of the Godhead. Would you stand, please? I'm not going to ask you to come to the front today because I believe that this is something we all need to do and I don't want to create a division between us and them or anything like that. Thank you, Jesus. Would you lift your hands in a sign of surrender to Jesus? Lord, we surrender our heart again today. Lord, we surrender again our vessel. Clean us up, Lord. Purify. Deepen our vessels. Make us whole. Make us worthy to carry the treasure. Lord, we may be somebody's miracle. We may be the answer to somebody's prayer, but we've got to get our vessels pure. We've got to come in humility and say, Lord, fill me. Use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Make me ready to carry the treasure, Lord. Make me ready to be poured out. God, I choose today you to look to you, only you, as my treasure. Jesus, you are all that I need. You are the deep peace within. You are the light that shines in the darkness. You are the light that shines into the darkest places of my soul, to the things where I don't talk to anybody else about them. I can talk to you about them, Lord. All of you, for all of my days, for all of my needs, I trust the treasure I trust that the treasure is enough. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. I surrender all to you. Everything I
at this time, I want to release the Pathways group. You can go ahead and make your way out quietly and reverently. But I spoke today to what's mostly a group of seasoned saints, believers who have already made the decision to commit their life to Christ. But I want to give the opportunity to anyone who's not yet made that decision. So if you're in this house and you've never said to Christ, Lord, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I need help. And you're my only hope, Lord. If you've not made that decision to surrender your life to him and, and give it all up and give it over, now's your chance. I don't believe in scare tactics, but I do believe that today is the day of salvation and you should not wait. We do not know what tomorrow holds. We are not promised another day, another moment, another minute. And so if you would like to receive prayer to have Christ come and live in you, to heal you, to forgive you, to change your life. Would you come to the front? We've got people that'll pray for you, people that'll walk you through the steps to salvation. And we'll, we'll wait with you here as long as you need. Our God is good, our God is faithful. He's good. And if you just don't have the courage to get up out of your seat today, that's okay. Find somebody and tell them. Would our elders and pastors raise your hands? One of these people will pray for you. Find one of them. You'll never, ever, ever regret making that decision today. You'll wish you had done it sooner. His salvation is full and free. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to pay for it. The treasure that we spoke of today, you don't have to buy it. It's full and free. If you will surrender your vessel, if you will surrender your heart to him, Everything that he was and ever will be can be yours. I love you, River family. It's been a pleasure worshiping with you all today. Go be Jesus. Go be the treasure to your world today, to your family, to your kids. In Jesus' name, we'll see you Wednesday for prayer. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. And please continue to pray for our building project every day. We need you to pray. We need to be covered. Have a wonderful week.